Oh, okay, so let's start. Yes. Uh, Kochi Hashimoto from uh, Kyoto University, and he's talking about deep learning and holographic QCD. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm Koji uh, from uh, uh, talking from Japan. Uh, it's just a pity that I cannot come to uh, Italy for this uh, very nice workshop. And in fact, uh, there is a time difference between ours and yours, eight hours. Uh, it makes me quite difficult to uh, attend the talks in the afternoon in your time. But uh, I'd like to do my best for delivering my excited, uh, excited feelings uh, about this holographic QCD research using deep learning. So uh, uh, I have many collaborators, uh, starting with uh, Tanaka-san and Tomiya-san and Sugishita-san uh, already three years ago. The project started four years ago. And it still continues. And uh, so very recently, uh, I, I have published a paper with uh, Ohashi-san, Sumimoto-san, to find out the complete gravity dual Lagrangian, uh, which is supposed to uh, be dual to QCD. So uh, I'm very happy to accomplish uh, this result and uh, tell you about uh, what I found uh, using deep learning. Uh, by the way, uh, as uh, uh, so, so this is the book which I've written with uh, Tomiya-san and uh, Tanaka-san. It's in Springer, so please Google uh, this name, Deep Learning and Physics. And a part of my talk uh, is actually written in this textbook. Okay, so uh, let me explain my motivation first uh, before getting into the machine learning uh, stuffs. So uh, my uh, goal is to understand what is ADS safety correspondence. So this is, uh, I think, uh, very important for uh, even for uh, lattice people, since uh, lattice usually deals with uh, strongly coupled gauge theories. And in a certain limit, we believe that uh, there is a gravity description of those theories. So that is a kind of feature of uh, the hidden feature of large and gauge theories. And this feature is uh, quite nice to us uh, since we know that gravity is quite interesting physics. And in fact, uh, large and gauge theory uh, includes uh, gravity in a certain limit as a feature. So we want to find out this feature explicitly from a given uh, quantum field theory, for example. And uh, what uh, uh, we are quite familiar with is QCD among uh, many uh, gauge theories and people, uh, including uh, Lattice uh, QCD uh, uh, researchers, worked on that quite a lot uh, for many years. So we have uh, quite a big knowledge about uh, QCD and uh, strongly coupled case theories. That means that we have uh, many data. So from those data, if we dig out the feature which uh, looks like a gravitational physics, then that would uh, actually become a key for understanding ADS safety correspondence, which might be the definition of quantum gravity. So uh, QCD actually allows uh, many interesting gravity modeling. And uh, here is the uh, schematic picture of uh, conventional holographic QCD modeling. So how do we do that? So we prepare uh, first uh, with uh, our favorite quantum field theory like QCD and solve QCD by numerical simulations or experiments for the case of QCD to prepare some data. And we want to understand the, what the data is and what the hidden description of this data is. And gravity model actually uh, uh, helps uh, with this area safety correspondence. So what is gravity model? Uh, if you are a holographic QCD researcher, then you have to write down, for example, a gravity theory or Lagrangian, uh, which has the space-time dimensions, one dimension higher than the original quantum field theory. So that is holographic principle test. So uh, you have the action. Uh, you, can pre uh, you can have a, a arbitrary kind of action. It could be just Einstein Hilbert action, or you can put many matter fields, or cosmological constant, or you can modify gravity. So uh, any kind of uh, gravity model uh, is at your hand. And then uh, once action is given, then what you do is to solve the equation of motion for gravity 
and meta fields, and then uh, get some explicit metric field, which is curved. Uh, for example, it's curved uh, ADS-like geometry in five dimensions. And using this uh, metric, you can compute many things. For example, you can put matter fields and uh, consider fluctuations and consider spectra and so on. Then that gives you uh, some predictions to the quantum field theory, which is supposed to be living at the boundary of this uh, uh, space, higher dimensional space time. And then uh, these holographic predictions are compared with uh, these uh, experimental lattice data. Then if this matching uh, goes well, then you say that, oh, this is a great, good uh, gravity model, uh, which can capture the feature of uh, QCD. But who knows? Uh, you need to be a genius to find out the gravity model, but uh, it's not, then it's not a science. So what I want to do is to overcome this uh, difficulty uh, in modeling uh, QCD using gravity. So how do we do that? In fact, it's a, a big stream in ADS safety correspondence, which is called bulk reconstruction. So bulk reconstruction means that you start with quantum field theory and prepare the data, that's the same, to find out gravity model, rather than finding or preparing some model at your hands, you just start with the bottom. Bottom means the data. So uh, using some data, you reconstruct the bulk geometry, uh, which reproduces this data somehow. So this is a kind of inverse problem and it's difficult to solve, but suppose you could do it. Then you get the metric function. This metric function is a solution of some gravity model, but we don't know the gravity model. So if you can do it backwards, like having a solution and what is the equation of motion, then if you can solve this inverse problem, then you get the action. Once you get the action, then you can do everything, uh, what, whatever uh, the uh, holographic QCD researchers did. For example, using this action and its solution, uh, for example, once action is given, then you can have many, many solutions. One solution is temperature zero. The other solution may be temperature non-zero. So using this action, you can have various predictions for various temperatures. So for example, you can get some prediction and then you can compare that with some other data of QCD. So this is the point of bulk reconstruction. But however, so as you easily notice, uh, this includes the difficulty. So starting from data, you need to reconstruct the bulk. So that's the bulk reconstruction technology. And I don't review in this talk, but that there are several uh, ways uh, uh, which are known for the bulk reconstruction. One is using entanglement entropy, the other uses Wilson loops, the other uses blah, 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 the spectrum. And uh, one of them actually is what I propose as a deep learning method. So deep learning is uh, well known for uh, solving uh, classification and also uh, inverse solving inverse programs. So why not using deep learning for uh, going backwards in this figure upwards? So uh, let me turn to the motivation for deep learning. Uh, my work actually started with uh, finding out uh, this uh, shocking similarity between deep learning architecture and uh, Penrose diagram. So on your left-hand side, I have the uh, a Penrose diagram of maximally extended eternal ads schwarzschild black hole. Maybe uh, some of you know uh, this Penrose diagram. Penrose diagram is the diagram are representing space-time in a compact manner. You don't need to know the details about that. On the right-hand side, I have the picture of deep autoencoder, which was, uh, so, so a similar picture was uh, shown by uh, Funai-san. And I saw the similarity between these two. Uh, that's interesting. So the figures looks similar to each other. And the concept also looks similar to each other. The reason is that in the case of deep autoencoder, the data is put at the boundary of this uh, neural network. On the other hand, in this ADS CFT, the QFT data sits at the boundary of the space time. Okay. And then what I wanted to do is to have the bulk reconstruction. The bulk is uh, inside of this uh, figure. So from this data, 
at the boundary, I want to construct the geometry inside. In the case of deep autoencoder, uh, if you prepare data, then to, uh, in the case of autoencoder, to reproduce the uh, input data as an output data, uh, this network actually tunes itself. The weights are automatically tuned. So uh, the resultant, uh, resultant network is kind of emergent out of the data to pick up the feature, right? So if I discretize the uh, space time inside and let, uh, ident let me identify this space time by this neural network, then uh, input data uh, can actually automatically uh, tune the geometry so that it goes well. So the concept of these two look quite similar to me, at least to me. So uh, this is the starting point of our uh, work four years ago. And now uh, to uh, make uh, this kind of correspondence more in detail, actually leads us to find out the gravity Lagrangian, which is dual to QCD. Okay, so uh, my uh, talk is divided into six uh, sections. The first half is uh, some kind of uh, general uh, ideas when and in what situation space and time can be regarded as a neural network. And then I go to holographic space time. So I get into a very specific model of holographic QCD, understanding from data, I can fix the uh, space time geometry from the data. And then using this uh, uh, emergent geometry metric, I can reconstruct the bulk uh, gravity Lagrangian. And using that, we can do predictions for other observables. Okay, so let me start. So if you have any question, please stop me anytime. So first, uh, space is a neural network. So, how, so when uh, space becomes a neural network? Unfortunately, general neural network is not a space, as you may easily find out. The reason is that uh, if you say space, then space needs some notion of locality. Since space is made of distance, so distance needs to be defined. But in general, neural network, uh, you prepare all to all connections. So even though you uh, regard these circles, those are units, as some space-time points, all points are connected with each other. So distance cannot be defined. Distance uh, needs some uh, uh, principles, right? Uh, uh, so like a triangular inequality and blah, blah, blah. So distance needs to be defined for this neural network to be space. So this is a perceptron model. This is a Boltzmann machine. So all of these, uh, usually you allow uh, uh, infinite connections. So this is not space. However, if you put uh, some constraints on allowed weights, then uh, some neural network can be regarded as a space. So this is a constraint which reduces the number of uh, tunable weights. So uh, it's a sparse neural network. The very uh, famous example is that this convolutional layer uh, where locality can be imposed. The reason is that uh, in the convolutional layer, you have, uh, uh, for example, this kind of structure, uh, which connects only the nearby uh, units in this way. And these three lines are parallelly translated to be imposed to take the same value for the translated uh, uh, weights. So in this way, you put constraints and only the nearby units are connected by weights. So this uh, is the way you can uh, have the locality in neural network. So for example, let me uh, specify this uh, vertical direction as space. So x at one point, uh, x at one point. And if I uh, define the distance between these two as delta x, like a lattice model, then uh, these are in, uh, labeled by integer n. So n delta x. The input is a function of n delta x. So if uh, this is written in a field, field theoretical way, then this is phi of n delta x. 
then you uh, move from the first layer to the second layer by using this neural network, then what is the output? The output actually depends on only the nearby X points. So this means that the output is just written by this kind of uh, derivatives. And the locality means that the derivative, uh, actually the number of derivative is actually, actually finite. Okay. So in this way, the uh, uh, a particular kind of uh, sparse neural network can be regarded as a space. So what about time? Uh, in fact, time is all, all uh, in the same way introduced into the notion of neural network. You can remember ResNet, which is the very famous uh, easily trainable uh, neural network. And the uh, construction of a ResNet is quite easy. So this is the first layer. Uh, this is the second layer, the output. Normally in the neural network, you multiply some matrix. This is the weight. And then you uh, put an activation function, which is F. Uh, here in the, in the picture, I schematically divided these two uh, actions into two parts, the linear transformation and activation function. And if you have only these two lines, then that is a new standard neural network. However, in this ResNet, you have a skip connection. So this skip connection means that you need to add the original, this one, value to the output like this. And this makes the training uh, quite easy, somehow. And uh, you easily notice that uh, this is equivalent to the discretized dynamical system. The dynamical system is normally written by this kind of equation. So it's a time uh, evolution system. Uh, X of T is given, then the X derivative is given by this uh, equation. This determines the dynamics. And now if you discretize time, then you get uh, this equation. This is a discretized differential equation. And now uh, you can easily see the similarity between these two. So this means that ResNet, which was invented to uh, make the training easier, has a physical meaning of time evolution. The time evolution in this case, the time is going to the deeper layers. So if this is true, then uh, how we can use it? And in fact, uh, this, is, uh, this can be used for finding the Hamiltonian uh, from data. For example, uh, this is the Hamilton equation for one dimensional system. Now suppose you don't know the Hamiltonian, but you know the data. Data means that uh, this is the uh, motion of a point particle. And at some, at certain time, it is located here. At some other time, this is located there. And you know the data. And then you want to reconstruct the Hamiltonian from that. So how do you do that? So one way to do that is uh, to construct the time evolution as a neural network. So this is a schematic picture. So Q and P are two values for a time T input, and this is the out output. I mean, uh, delta T, uh, T plus delta T, this particle goes to some other uh, position with uh, some other value velocity. So the output is different, right? And then I suppose you don't know uh, inside, okay? You know the data. So uh, uh, you can train this neural network so that the loss goes down. And finally, you get some weights. And if this weight uh, can be interpreted as a Hamiltonian, then you can find the Hamiltonian from the weights. So that's the, that's the point. So in fact, uh, uh, the easy, uh, trial of uh, using this uh, very simple, just one layer neural network uh, doesn't help us. It is easy to show that, in fact, the neural network uh, of this does not give you a nonlinear Hamiltonian, unfortunately, although uh, this has a nonlinear uh, activation function. But so you need uh, some more tricks. If you have uh, some, uh, some kind of uh, tricks, by preparing uh, for some uh, hit kind of uh, a virtual units, uh, which doesn't take any value, then in fact, uh, uh, a very uh, large uh, class of Hamiltonians can be written as a neural network time evolution. And using this, 
uh, if you prepare some data uh, from experiments or something, then you can train the neural network to find out the Hamilton. So in this uh, way, uh, time is the depth direction of the neural network. And in fact, this was used in some uh, literature uh, quite much. Uh, for example, uh, the Boltzmann machine can be considered as a Euclidean time evolution. So uh, you may know that uh, uh, there is a huge uh, machinery, uh, new machinery in condensed matter physics to find out ground state wave function from given Hamiltonian. So how do you do that? So from given Hamiltonian, you prepare an ansatz for wave function. And normally, so as for uh, wave function, you have uh, like uh, matrix product states or tensor network states. Some uh, famous popular uh, ansatz were used. So Cario and, Cario and Troya in 2017, uh, they used neural network ground state wave function, and then they succeeded in finding the ground states using that ansatz. And people actually uh, discussed why this neural network model can work to represent uh, wave functions. And one uh, interpretation is uh, given by this uh, Cario, Nomura, and Imada in 2018. That was this. So suppose uh, you need to find out the ground state of Hamiltonian of one dimension. So this direction is a uh, spatial dimension, like you have a spin, uh, one dimensional spin chain. Then uh, normally, uh, it is actually known that a uh, ground state wind function can be obtained by a successive uh, application of this Euclidean time evolution uh, by the original Hamiltonian. The reason is that if you apply this to any function, any wave function, then finally uh, H is zero remains, right? Since this is the uh, Boltzmann wave. So this is the simple reason. And if I interpret this part as a neural network, then this means that you have a very deep neural network, uh, which actually forgets uh, what was the uh, boundary condition around here. So this means that the deep Boltzmann machine uh, depicted like this with a specific identification of the sparse neural network as a Hamiltonian gives you the ground state. So uh, this uh, horizontal direction can be understood as a Euclidean time direction. And in fact, Euclidean time is nothing but space. So uh, you can think of this as a spatial propagation or something. So this is the end of story of uh, space and time as a neural network. Do you have any questions so far? Uh, if not, let me... Okay. Maybe, uh, yeah, I continue. Thank you very much. So uh, in section three, uh, I'll tell you the idea of how holographic space-time can be uh, like a neural network. And then section four and five, I'll give you the detailed uh, model of a uh, uh, neural network model uh, dual to QCD. So uh, how ADS-CFT can be understood as a neural network? So let me use the uh, example of deep Boltzmann machine. In fact, a deep Boltzmann machine can be regarded as an example of holographic principle. So why is that? Uh, as explained by Funaisan this morning, uh, deep Boltzmann machine consists of uh, this kind of structure with the uh, left-hand side, these units are uh, visible units but inside units are hidden units. And what you measure is the probability distribution for given values of this visi visible unit uh, values, VI. As a summation of uh, uh, exponentiation of energy function, where uh, hidden unit variables are summed. On the other hand, in ADS-CFT correspondence, the uh, bound at the boundary, uh, some conformal field theory or quantum field theory the, uh, lives. And the most important quantity in quantum field theory is the partition function. So this is the partition function with source J. In ADS-CFT correspondence, 
uh, this partial function of a given quantum field theory is equal to some gravity on shell equation of motion, uh, uh, gravity, uh, gravity partition function, I'm sorry, where the constraint is that the uh, source function for this quantum field theory is the boundary value of the field propagating in the bulk geometry. So uh, there is a strong similarity between these two, right? The uh, partial function can be regarded as a kind of uh, a probability distribution for a given source. So as you know, this is a generating functional for uh, correlation functions of all kinds in quantum field theory. So this is the uh, biggest and the most important thing in quantum field theory. And that is given by a certain uh, sum over a hidden variable phi. And what is exponentiated is the gravity action. On the other hand, here it's an energy functional. So if you actually uh, fine tune all of these uh, weights and energy functions, then uh, you can actually mimic this ADS CFT precisely in terms of deep Boltzmann machine. I don't go to the details of how these are corresponding with each other, but you can construct the correspondence. It's uh, unfortunately not so useful since this is a formal correspondence between these two. So actually uh, the use of uh, say Boltzmann machine for uh, uh, actual uh, training of probability distribution doesn't go well, you know? So uh, this is not uh, the real use. However, uh, formally, uh, you can have the correspondence. So this is the dictionary between these two. For example, this uh, bulk coordinate Z which is this direction can be interpreted as interpreted as a hidden layer label K. So this is the depth direction. QFT source function is the input value V. The bulk field is a hidden variable and blah, blah, blah. So uh, how we can use it? In section four, uh, I'd like to explain the uh, case of uh, training the neural network and interpret that as a geometry emergent from the data. So this is a one page uh, summary of holographic QCD model, which is the simplest. It's called a bottom up uh, holographic QCD model. It was invented uh, more than 10 years ago and it's so easy. So many people tried to use uh, this uh, model to mimic QCD observables. But as I said, the difficulty is to prepare a specific geometry to start with. So normally uh, in conventional holographic QCD modeling, as I said, we start with the five dimensional uh, curved space gravity model, and then solve the equation of motion to get the predictions. So the most important part is to prepare for this geometry. For example, this G. Phi is the uh, scalar field propagating in this geometry G. How do you determine this G? So if you know the uh, bulk Einstein action, then you can solve this Einstein equation to get G. But if you naively solve Einstein equation, then the result is uh, like pure ADS or ads Schwarzschild solution, that does not actually reproduce QCD data. So that's bad solution. So how do we identify good geometry? So that is uh, what I do in the next page. But here, uh, let me explain what is the conventional uh, QC, holographic QCD modeling goals. So we prepare a classical scalar field in the background of five-dimensional curved space-time. So this needs to be asymptotically ADS. The metric is G, phi is the scalar field, and V is the scalar potential. So scalar potential could be, for example, phi four uh, potential, but the coefficient of this potential uh, is uh, not known normally. So if you are conventional holographic QCD theorist, then you you need to be genius to find out what is the potential. For example, lambda coefficient, lambda needs to be one or it's 0 0.1 or something. 
something like that. Then this is the geometry you prepare, F and G. Uh, this could be just ADS world side black hole solution or pure ADS solution. The condition these F and G needs to satisfy is just that at the ADS boundary, which is parameterized as eta is infinite, uh, F and G goes like exponential function with the normalization L, which is ADS radius. And on the other hand, at the other boundary, eta is zero. We suppose that there is a black hole horizon uh, for finite temperature situation. And at black hole, we know that F goes like eta squared and G goes to constant. So these are two kind of conditions at the boundaries of this geometry, uh, which uh, F and G satisfy. So in conventional holographic QCD modeling, uh, you specify F and G functions and then compute the following. We solve the equation of motion to get uh, this kind of chiral condensate response as a function of quark mass. So what do we do? So uh, for given F and G, you solve the equation of motion of this uh, action for phi. And then uh, phi can be uh, expanded at ADS boundary like this. So there are two solutions at ADS boundary. One goes exponential minus eta. The other goes exponential minus three times eta. So this is always true uh, since we use this form of uh, metric uh, function. And now chiral condensate is a coefficient of this function. Quark mass uh, corresponds to the coefficient of this function. And if these two are related, then we know uh, this uh, quite important quantity in lattice QCD. So how these two are related? Since this is the second order differential equations, there are two solutions. Those are independent. However, at the other side of the geometry, there is a black hole horizon. So at eta equal to zero, this function phi uh, needs to satisfy this black hole boundary condition. So this condition actually relates uh, this coefficient and this coefficient. So in this way, for given geometry, we can get chiral condensate as a function of quark mass. So this is the brief summary of how you can get QCD observables from gravity model. So now what I want to do is the backwards. So for a given, uh, this chiral condensate as a function of quark mass, I want to determine F and G. So how do I do that? In fact, if I uh, regard this geometry as a neural network, then we can do it. Uh, we saw before that Hamiltonian of time evolution can be determined from data. So this is the same. Even though this eta is a spatial direction, uh, you can do the same. So uh, what I do is to construct a neural network, which actually has the same form as the equation of motion of uh, which I want to solve. So this is the equation of motion uh, derived from the Lagrangian in the uh, previous slide. And where uh, H is the unknown function composed of F and G, which are unknown functions. So this part is the metric. Now I want to mimic this equation of motion by a neural network propagation. That's easy. You discretize this eta direction by the amount of lattice uh, spacing, delta eta. And then I construct a deep neural network. I have only two units in the horizontal direction because I consider only the homogeneous data in spatial directions. So the, uh, this vertical direction was the spatial directions of uh, QFT. However, we, I don't need to consider that direction for this data, since chiral condensate is supposed to be homogeneous. Now, uh, phi and its uh, momentum conjugate pi, uh, this equation can be mapped to a neural network like this. And these green weights are trainable uh, weights, but these blocks lines are not trainable. So these are fixed 
to interpret this neural network as a space. Okay, then I construct, uh, I prepare the data, chiral condensate data from uh, lattice QCD simulation, and then use that to train this neural network so that this geometry reproduces the chiral condensate data of lattice QCD. The result is quite interesting. On the right, left hand side, there is a, 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 a QCD, a lattice QCD data of chiral condensate as a function of coke mass. So these green curve uh, represent the uh, lattice QCD data. On the right hand side, I have the uh, plot of this H function, uh, which is nothing but the weights of our uh, my neural network. And the initial value is zigzag. But if I run the training, then yeah, in this way, finally, to uh, the geometry is determined so that it reproduces the lattice QCD data. The geometry is uh, has a strange shape. It has a, a dip here, and it goes up like this. And the, in fact, uh, going up like this is nothing but the black hole horizon condition. So somehow this uh, neural network automatically uh, learned the presence of horizon, which I did not impose. And this uh, training can be done uh, with, for example, neural ODE, uh, which does not uh, require actual discretization of space time. Uh, I don't uh, talk about this neural ODE technique, which is uh, technically in more detail, but uh, neural ODE is, is a very nice technology developed in machine learning to determine Hamiltonian in a continuous space. So anyway, uh, in this way, uh, I can determine the geometry uh, H function like this. And also the coupling constant can be determined in a similar way. How, how many more minutes I have? Like 10 minutes? I don't know. Oh, the laptop was muted. Okay, so normally until uh, uh, forty, but uh, let's say we can we can go to forty five. I see, including the discussion. Uh, we will be flexible. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much. So uh, let me talk also about this uh, number five two. So uh, here, uh, so in section four, I used current condensate as a data of uh, lattice QCD to uh, bulk reconstruct the geometry. And in section five, I use the uh, meson spectrum as a data to determine the bulk metric. So here is an, another one page summary of how you can get uh, meson spectrum in the gravity model. So this is a conventional holographic QCD approach so from a five-dimensional uh, Lagrangian, you solve equation, motion, and blah, 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 then you get meson spectrum. So let me briefly explain how it goes. So you start with uh, this vector field Lagrangian in five dimensions with uh, a certain metric uh, specified. So in the previous section, I used scalar function for chiral condensate, but here is for a vector meson, so I use vector field in the bulk. Then the metric function uh, normally uh, at zero temperature is parameterized like this, where A is some specific function and phi is the dilaton field. And at ADS boundary, uh, this is the boundary condition, log Z. So Z is the horizontal uh, bulk uh, depth direction. And now uh, we solve the equation of motion for this vector field and then decompose it into energy eigenstates. Then uh, basically this energy is nothing but the mass of the vector mass. So that's easy. So spectrum in the bulk correspond to the spectrum 
of QCD. So this is the famous holographic QCD model uh, by Kurt Katzson and Stefano in 2006. I want to do the backwards. For given vector meson spectra of uh, lattice QCD or experimental QCD, I want to determine the geometry, which is parameterized by this A function and the Dilaton field phi. I can do it as you can easily guess. So I decompose this bulk equation of motion and make it like a neural network. And input is the vector meson data, and then train this neural network to find out the metric. So this is the data for rho meson mass, for example. Uh, the first excited, so the ground state rho meson mass is this. The first excited rho meson mass is this. So positive data is uh, specified around here, and then negative data are prepared uh, away from those. Then I can train the neural network, then emergent metric function, uh, which is a combination of Dilaton and metric field is like this. So anyway, I can get the geometry. So in this way, I can bulk reconstruct the geometry uh, from QCD data. So finally, uh, I will explain how uh, gravity theory itself can be reconstructed. This is a picture which I showed, and I'm concentrating on the left-hand side picture where uh, this red uh, upward arrow is a deep neural network method. So I could determine this metric function. And once metric is uh, solved, then uh, I can find out the action since uh, the metric needs to be a solution of equation of motion of this gravity action. Okay. Let me be more precise. So this is what I did. Bottom is QCD, and I used chiral condensate to construct the bulk geometry in section four. In section five, I used rho meson spectrum to build the bulk geometry. And these geometries are different. It's okay that they are different since meson spectrum is at temperature zero, chiral condensate is at temperature non-zero. So these two are different values of temperature. But hopefully we uh, need that these two give is, uh, 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 the solutions of a single action, gravity action. So here, uh, as I said, the uh, chiral condensate determined the metric, which looks like this. Meson spectrum determined the metric, which looks like this. And uh, what kind of action which uh, we uh, expect? The action is the Einstein gravity. But if it is just Einstein gravity, then solutions are just Einstein Schwarzschild. shield, uh, sorry. A Schwarz should black hole solution. And they don't look like this. They don't look like this. So Einstein action only does not help us. So uh, I need to enlarge the category of action. So I included Dilaton field with arbitrary Dilaton potential. I don't know what is the Dilaton potential, but if this Dilaton potential is nicely chosen, then it will reproduce this uh, geometry as a solution. So this is uh, determining the action backwards or inversely like this. And for this uh, course, I can actually determine uh, V of phi. It is technically really involved, but uh, you can actually do that. For given geometry, you can build the Lagrangian, which uh, solves uh, this geometry as a solution. The Dilaton potential looks like this. So uh, this is a dilaton, this is a potential, and it looks that it has it goes down first and then exponentially grows. So this is what we did. And then using this gravity model, for example, uh, I can calculate some other QCD observables as a prediction. So let me uh, summarize my talk by showing this uh, result. So this is the, uh, the final slide. So in the uh, background, I showed the lattice QCD data 
for uh, uh, Wilson loop. So uh, for various values of the temperature. If temperature is low, then there is a linear confinement potential. But if the temperature is high, then there is a device screening and it's cut like this. So uh, different colors correspond to different values of temperature. And then here, uh, these are curved uh, lines plotted by red circles, this line and this line. This is the uh, prediction from uh, this determined gravity model. And this red uh, thin line correspond to the device screening effect predicted by this gravity model. So as you see, uh, very interestingly, uh, our prediction uh, determined from this gravity model matches quite well with that QCD result. Uh, please note that this model is not written by myself. It was written by machine. So this chiral condensate data determines this model and then prediction is from this model and it matches other observable of lattice QCD. So this is a nice successful cycle of a modeling gravity model. And if, it, if you can use some other observables, then we can make uh, this model more precise. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you Koji for this nice talk. Are there any questions? Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's very interesting. Thank you very much for the nice talk with uh, Biagio Lucini here. I wanted to know uh, that the nice slide was uh, particularly fascinating. Uh, how much uh, uh, quantitatively do you agree with the lattice data? Is that just the shape? Or because, I mean, you know, you have put real data in, mm -hmm. uh, I would expect that within a, a few percent, you should reproduce. I mean, if the mechanism has to do with the physics, you should reproduce within some percent or some, well, mm -hmm. some discrepancy, you should reproduce, for instance, the string tension in the intermediate regime. Mm -hmm. uh, does it well, happen and to, we, to, to which level it happens or to which level it doesn't happen? Ah, uh, thank you for a nice question. So uh, what was surprising to me was actually that uh, this uh, match is too good. So uh, what it means is that uh, this string breaking scale, uh, string breaking, breaking length, uh, it is predicted like a 0 0.5 femtometer uh, from my model. And it exactly matches the lattice, lattice result. So uh, normally the gravity model uh, need to match the real QCD within like 10% or optimi mm, a pessim pessimistically 30%. The reason is that uh, since gravity model should work in the large end limit and QCD has MC equal to three. So uh, even though we assume that the correction would be one by MC squared, the 10% disagreement is expected. So uh, in, uh, from that viewpoint, I think this model is too good uh, since this string breaking scale matches exactly. What do you think? Thank you. Okay, I don't see any more questions. Then let's uh, thank Koshi again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.